Now we're glad to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. May the Lord bless you. We appreciate you that's visiting with us. Always glad to have visitors. May God bless everyone. And to you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the next hour we can be an inspiration to you. And you in the radio listening audience, if you call someone, have them to tune in and get the Northside Baptist Church Hour. We'll try to be a blessing to them. So Paul will take over at this time. What he has lined up for us, I'm sure will be a blessing to our hearts. So Paul at this time. Get your hymn on, turn to page 364. God leads us along. sing a song now entitled He Knows.
I want you to take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 15. Remember, we record the Sunday morning programs each Sunday morning, and they're available on cassette tape. So you turn to Luke chapter 15. I'm going to read a few uh, verses of Scripture found there, and I want to expound these verses for you. There's some blessed thoughts and some meat and refreshing things found in Luke chapter 15 I want to point out to you today. And if you have your Bible open, we'll begin reading with verse 1. It's page 1096 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. And look at verse 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if you lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in, the, in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, even more than over ninety and nine just persons, which need no repentance. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle, and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she's found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angel of God of one sinner that repenteth. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the young of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance throughout his living. And when he spent all, there rose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hide servants of my fathers have bread and enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of the hide servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. That's reading from Luke chapter 15, the first 24 verses. I want to speak to you on this line of thought. The parable of the lost things found. Now here you find three parables in one. The parable of the lost things found. Now keep that in mind. Joy is the issue included in these parables. Keep that in mind. Joy, joy, joy. You'll find that in the conclusion of each one. The lost sheep is carried back into the fold. The lost silver is put into the purse. The lost son is pardoned. you find that in all three parables. The first one, the shepherd is suffering. The second one, the woman is seeking. The third one, the father is singing because the lost boy is back home. In the first one, we have God the Son. In the second one, we have God the Spirit. In the third one, we have God the Father. The Savior here is winning. The Spirit is wooing. And the Father is welcoming His Son back home. I want you to keep that in mind as we move along in this narrative, expatiating upon these verses to pass on some you, to you some beautiful thoughts found here in the Scripture. Now notice the lost sheep is out of the flock. The lost silver is out of the funds. The lost son is out of the family. So you keep that in mind. The lost sheep is in a place of danger. The lost silver is in a place of darkness. The lost son is in a place of distance. 
And so we find there's joy, joy, wonderful joy, at the end of every occasion. So you keep that in mind as we move along. Remember the shepherd is suffering. He went out and there he sought for that lost sheep on the mountain. And he sought for it until he found it. There you have the suffering shepherd. No doubt he went over the stones, into the valleys, over the hills, through the briars, under the brushes, calling and longing for that sheep. And he is a suffering shepherd, but he did not stop until he found it. The Lord Jesus Christ is our shepherd. He was a good shepherd in death. He's the great shepherd now is our high priest. He'll be the chief shepherd when he comes again for the church. And the shepherd now is on the mountains, in the valleys, across the small streams, looking for the poor lost sheep. And he goes on suffering and suffering and longing and calling until he finds that sheep. He never gives up. And then we find the woman is seeking. She's a picture of the Holy Spirit that's seeking out lost sinners to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said the Lord came to seek and to save that which is lost. And it's the Holy Spirit of God that's doing the seeking, seeking out poor lost sinners. And then, of course, the Father. We find Him, the Father. The third one, of course, is the Father, a type of uh, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the devil here, you find in this scripture, is the travel agency of this world. He always points out a beautiful picture. He said to this young boy, you take what belongs to you and you leave home and go into a far away country and there you can have a good time. And the devil began to point out the good things that would come to this boy ere he got away from the father's house. The devil kept putting that on his mind. And remember that he is the travel agency of the world and he will point out things for you to go and directions for you to go, trying to prove to you you can have a good time if you get away from home, away from your church, or out somewhere on your own. And he said there is friendship out there. If you'll leave home and leave your father's house, my at the fun you'll have, my at the freedom you'll have, and the friends, they'll be out there waiting for you. The devil is selling this boy on the idea of leaving his father's house, and he's pointing a beautiful picture. We have in verse 11, the straying son and the staying son. They are both lost. The straying son is lost, and the staying son is lost. You have that if you notice in verse 11. They are both lost. And then the straying son begins to say, give me, in verse 12. He's about ready to stray away from the father's house. He said, give me, give me. Now, he did not want the Father's presence. He wanted what the Father had and what he thought that was coming to him, but he did not want his Father's presence. You have a lot of people today, they want to be saved. They want to go to heaven. They want to go to a better world when they die, but they do not want to be found in God's house on Sunday. They'd rather be out on the lake somewhere, or lying at home in the bed, or going to the mountains, or visiting old Aunt Jane, or Uncle Tom, rather than be in the house of God. They want God's presence when they come to die. They want God's blessings. They want to go to heaven, but they do not want to be in the presence of God where He promised to meet with them, that is, in the house of God. Now, this young man had lust in his heart before he found dust on his feet. Deep down in his heart, he says, I'm going and have a good time. I'm only young one time. I'm getting away from this house. My father's too strict on me. I'm going to travel down the highway of time and have me a ball. He had lust in his heart before he had dust on his feet. And so we find the same case with Eve and with Achan in the Bible. There we find that Eve had lust in her heart and eyes before she ate the forbidden fruit. We find that Achan had lust in his heart and mind before he took the wedge of silver and gold and the Babylonian garment. This movement always starts in the heart. And this young man had lust in his heart before he got the dust on his feet. It happens like that always. Declaring his independence and indifference, he makes a departure. He says, I'm going on my way. 
I don't care how badly my father wants to keep me here. I'm leaving. I'm going on my way. So here he declares his independence. He shows his indifference and he makes his departure. He starts down the highway. Now it ends out of funds in verse 14, out of food in verse 16, and out of friends in verse 16. This man takes off, but eventually he winds up out of funds. He spent all of his money. And then he ends up out of food. He's got nothing to eat. And then he discovers all of a sudden he's out of friends. No man helped him. No man cared for him. The devil did not paint that picture when he told him to leave home. The devil did not show him he would eventually wind up out of funds, out of food, and out of friends. The devil never points out to you the picture of suffering down the highway when you leave the father's house. And so that's where he ended up. He is a waster and not a worker. God wants people to be willing to work and save and not be a waster. When Jesus fed the multitude, he said, take the baskets and fill them up with the leftovers. Don't you waste anything. The Bible said a man that won't work, he shouldn't eat. Let the rascal starve to death. And we'll do away with some of this welfare business today. A lot of people go to work rather than starve to death. And so we find here he's a waster and not a worker. Now the germ of sin is self-will, of course. And the goal of sin is separation from the Father. Now he said, I'm going to do my thing. Nobody tells me what to do. The spirit of the Antichrist today is self-willism. And that spirit is prevalent today among people in our high schools, in our colleges, and in our nation. Young people say, nobody's going to tell me what to do, not even my parents. A lot of people say, the law enforcement officers are not going to correct me. I'm not going to buy to the law of the land. And so they're not willing to be obedient. They're self-will. People say, everybody's doing it. We're living in the day when everybody's doing it. I'm going to do my thing. They're self-will. The Bible says in the book of Daniel, the Antichrist was a self-will individual. And when he comes on the scene, he's going to bring that spirit in its fullness. And you can already see and feel the spirit of the Antichrist today in the fact that people say, I'll do what I want to do. Nobody tells me what to do. I'm on my own. I'll do as I please. Oh, beloved, that's the spirit of the Antichrist. Here we see sin. We see sin based. We see sin beguiling. We see sin blinding. We see sin binding. And we see sin bankrupting. Here we find a young man in the, the basis of sin. That is, he's gone to the bottom. He's, he's ended up at the hog pen. He's a Jew and he hates swine. But he's ended up down there at the hog pen. That's the basis of sin. There he is. And then we find it beguiling. Now the Bible speaks about the devil beguiling you like he did Eve in the Garden of Eden with his subtlety. The devil, the travel agency of this world, beguiled this boy. Painted a beautiful picture of what would happen if he got away from home. He could have a good time. He beguiled him and then he blinded him to the fact that what might happen after he left the father's house. Sin is blinding, binding, and grinding, and bankrupting. So here we find the blindness of sin and it is binding. Here is a young man so hungry. No hope, no friends, no money until he joins himself to a citizen of that country, evidently a Gentile, and he's bound by that joining unto the Gentile and sent to feed swine. Sin is binding. Here he is at the old grist mill. They're binding, bound by sin. And then we find him bankrupting. That is, he went bankrupt. He had nothing. He was poor. He was wretched. He was bound by sin. They are feeding swine. Now his fortune goes, but his famine comes. After he lost his fortune, he inherited the famine. And that's exactly the way the devil works. When you lose your fortune, look out, the famine is on the way. It'll happen that way every time. We find his willful waste brings woeful wants. Look at verses 12 and 14. He went from wealth to want and to woe. That's the way he traveled. From wealth to want to woe. There he wanted something and then ended up in the hog pen and that was his woe. And then he joins himself to a citizen of that country 
had to feed swine. He joined the swine's club, if you please, in verse 15. And a Jew in those days could get no lower in the eyes of society than to go out and feed a bunch of hogs. Not only that, but he's eating the slop that the hogs ate. This boy is hit the bottom. He left home. And there he joined the swine's club. But clubs and lodges and even joining churches will not do in your dying hour. You got to know more than that. You got to know God and be born again. The same crowd that cheered him on now crucified him. They helped him spend his money. And now they said, that that's your problem, bud. We have no time for you anymore. A lot of young people will be your friend if you have a good automobile and a good job. But you lose your job, lose your automobile, get in jail and see how many will come to pay your fine kind of quick like. Young man told me that one time. He said, I had a new automobile, made some money, and I didn't know I did have so many friends. He said, I wrecked my car, lost my job, got in jail, and not a one of them showed up. That's the way the devil will do it. People be your friend as long as they can get something out of you and you have a little handout for them. But when you come to need, they are very hard to find. They're very scarce. By the case of the hen teeth, if you please. So the crowd that cheered him on now crucified him. Now you should stay with the sheep and not with the swine. This boy's made a terrible mistake. He exchanged a sheepfold to a swine pen. And he should have stayed, should have stayed with the sheep and not ended up down in the hog pen. There's a lot of you backslidden church members out there listening to me today in the radio listen audience. You're living in the hog pen. You ought to be in God's house in the sheep fall, but you're eating the husk that the swine does eat. You're too lazy to get up and get the family ready and go to church on Sunday. And yet you want to go to heaven when you die and you want God's blessings on you and your home. And don't kid yourself. They're not coming. Trouble is coming if you don't wake up and get back in fellowship with God. Now he went out to find satisfaction, but he found that it satisfies that it satisfies not. He said, I'll get satisfaction. I'll be happy. I'll enjoy it. And he kept seeking and looking, and he found that that satisfied not. Now sin begins with self-determination, but he ends with deterioration and degradation. That's what happens to people that get involved in sin in this manner. He now uh, has a conversation and a sober realization. Look at verse 17. He's beginning to do some talking now. And then he began to realize something. He has a conversation and a sober realization in verse 17. This old boy is beginning to wake up. He's gone to the hog pen. He's walling in the, the mud of the hog pen. He's eating the husk that the swine did eat. He's gone by as low as he could go. He's in bad shape. In verse 17, he comes to himself, remembering a misery brought him to, him, brought him to himself in verse 17. He remembers what's in the Father's house. And the misery that's in his own life brings him to himself. He begins to think. It's a shame that a lot of church members won't turn back to God until they become to misery and then they begin to remember what good things they had in the house of God. Now consideration is the first step to conversion. He began to consider something here. He said, what a fool I've been. Back in my father's house are many good things. How foolish I am. He realized he has sinned and he calls it what God called. He doesn't beat the devil around the bush. He said, I have sinned. Pharaoh said, I have sinned. Judas said, I have sinned. This man said, I have sinned. He didn't say I made a mistake. He didn't say I, I did a little something wrong here. didn't mean to do it. He was honest. He said, I have sinned. And at any time, a wandering child of God comes to a place where he admit that he's, he's sinned, then some hope for him. We have a lot of passing things that tell us in America today that was the time of the passing ending. That was the time of the passing of the buffalo. And today is the time of the passing of the buck. Everybody wants to pass the buck and blame it on somebody else. Adam said, that woman thou gavest me, she's responsible for this. The woman said, that serpent, he's the bird that caused me to do this. And everybody wants to pass the buck. And so we're living in the day of the passing of the buck. 
who always want to blame someone else. We notice here in this narrative the selfishness of sin. He said, give me in verse 12. We notice the sinfulness of sin, righteous living in verse 13. We see the suffering of sin. He's in want, verse 14. We see the shame of sin. He's feeding swine in verse 15. What a shame. We see the sinners of sin. I perish, he said, in verse 17. We see that here in the scripture. He does not deny his relationship to the Father. Verses 17 through 19. Not one time did he say, he's not my Father. He does deny that. He knows he left the Father back at the Father's house. He begins by requesting his rights in verse 5. He said, give me. He ends by resigning his rights in verse 19. He said, make me. Make me one of the hired servants. He says in verse 5, give me that that belongs to me. And now since he hit the bottom, he said, just make me one of the hired servants. You ever heard people say, I want my rights. I got to have my rights. I demand my rights. Well, this boy did the same. But when he come to himself, he said, make me just an old hired servant. He is lost by running from the father. He is found by returning to the father. Had he not come to himself, he would not have come to the father. Had he not come to the pigs in poverty, he would not have come to peace and plenty. But when he came to the pigs in poverty, he realized the peace and the plenty he had in the father's house. And he makes up his mind what to do about it. It's a shame that a lot of people has to come to the pigs in poverty before they'll get back to the peace and plenty that's waiting for them in the father's house. He receives no rebuke from the father. The father did not rebuke him when he came back home. His father didn't go out and cuss him out, take a stick and give him a beating. His father did not do that. His father was kind toward this boy, had compassion toward him. The father shows compassion. Now Jesus acted the same when he, they brought the woman taking adultery. They brought this woman to Jesus, said, we found this woman in the act of adultery. And we call it in the very act. Now Moses and the law said, uh, uh, we're going to we must stone that. What do you say about it? I wonder where the man was. Where was the man that she that they caught in the act of adultery? They said we caught the woman. Where was the man? Well, that Jay Bird might have been among that group accused her. Who knows? And then Jesus said, They without stone, let them cast without sin cast the first stone. And whenever he reached down and stooped on the ground and stood up again, that gang had walked away like a bunch of hound dogs and broke up a hen nest. Nobody standing there but the woman. And Jesus said, where is thine accusers? Who accused? She said, no man, Lord. Jesus said, neither do I. You go and sin no more. Jesus was kind and loving toward this poor fallen woman. He didn't beat over the head, cuss her out, knock her down. He was kind toward her. And so was the father toward the son. The father shows expression with eyes of mercy. He sees his son coming from a way off. He shows the expression here with the feet of mercy. He runs to meet that boy. Then we see the bowels of mercy had compassion on him. He fell on his neck and kissed him. We see the lips of mercy that he kissed this boy that had come back from the hog pen. You see this expression here in the action of the father. He left the father's house, but not one time, not one minute did he ever leave the father's heart. The father expresses forgiveness because the boy confesses. The boy came back confessing. He said, I have sinned. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And the father here expresses forgiveness on the basis and ground of the boy confessing his sinfulness and what he had done. He confessed. God's not going to forgive you unless you confess. But the Bible said if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He said he would go to the Father. That's what he said. But he goes to the Father. He gets up. He goes to the Father. But the Bible says the Father ran to meet him. The Father is in a greater hurry to meet that boy coming home than the boy is to get home. God is more concerned about you being saved than you are wanting to be saved. God is in a greater hurry to save you than you ought to get to God. Many people, when they got up out of the pew to come forward to be saved, God saved them right there. But they came down the altar, and there they did what the preacher told them to do. 
God wants to save you as a sinner and is more concerned and more anxious to save you than you are wanting to be saved. He came slowly with the burden of sin. The Father came swiftly with blessings. And there they met on the highway. He is recognized, number one, by the Father. He is received, number two, by the Father. He is ringed by the Father. He put a ring on his finger. He is robed by the Father. He put a robe on his back. He is restored by the Father. And now he rejoices with the Father. That ring is a seal of authority and ownership. Joseph received a ring from Pharaoh when he's made prime minister in Egypt, a place of authority. Every child of God has the ring, the seal of the Holy Spirit, as the child of God. And so he robes him. He didn't say, boy, go into the back room, you find an old robe back there and put that thing on. He said, no, sir, bring hither the best robe. You bring the best robe out of the wardrobe. They brought it, and there they placed it on the boy. The father placed the robe on the boy, tore away those old tattered garments, those old rags of the hog pen, and put a brand new robe on him. That's exactly what God does for you when you get saved. God takes away those old ragged garments of self-righteousness, which is filthy rags, and puts the robe of his righteousness on you as he imputes you, his righteousness to you. And then he rejoices with the father. He's restored back into fellowship, and now they rejoice. Here we have rags exchanged for a robe put on by the father. Here we have shoes put on him. He said, bring him a pair of shoes. In those days, servants went barefooted. Sons wore shoes. This boy came back from the hog pen with mud from the hog pen between his toes, as barefooted as he was the day he was born. And the father said, wash his feet, put him on a brand new pair of shoes. He's not going to be a servant around here. Why, he said, make me one of the hired servants. The father said, I'm not going to do it. You are my son. Put some shoes on his feet. God put shoes on the feet of his children that they might walk for him. And so we have shoes put on him. He's going barefooted no more. He's returned back to full sonship. And then the father said, get together, boys. Bring out that fatted cake. We're going to feast this boy. We're going to have a festival around here. We, we, we're going to have a jubilee. And they killed the fatted calf and they feasted the boy. They had a festival. They had a jubilee time and they rejoiced together. He now returns from misery to merriment. They're all merry and they're happy. God is more than a lawgiver. God is light. God is love. God is life. And God is grace in verse 17. And here we see the grace of God manifested toward this boy when he gets back home. Are you out of fellowship with God today? Are you a lost sinner? If so, you can get into God's fold, into the sheep fold, even today, if you desire to do so. Thank you so kindly. You listen well. Stand to your feet. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it. Speak to everyone that heard it. Make it a blessing to thy people. And may someone today Come out of the hog pen and come back to the Father's house in the radio listening audience or here in this auditorium. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.